Thank you. Now, is this mic on? Uh, can you hear me at the back? Yes, great. Thank you. So thank you, Natalie, for the introduction and uh, even more for having invited me here. Just in this um, last Sunday's New York Times Magazine, there's actually an article about a kid with FASD and his dog. And this child was adopted from Russia by American parents and brought to the States and along with the little girl they also adopted and it became apparent very early that this boy is troubled, uh, tantrums and screaming and inability to learn and behavior issues and it, you know the family's life became a nightmare. Now the cases of FVSD or fetal, fetal alcohol um, um, disease or, or the, the disorder uh, where it's extreme, you can have actually abnormalities in the kidneys and uh, the face, of course, uh, you know, the thinner lip and the flatter groove here, uh, abnormalities in the brain, in the heart, and so on. The outlook is poor for a lot of these kids, statistically, that is to say, and I'll be hasten to tell you that the outlook does not need to be poor that it is poor is not simply an outcome of the disorder. The, uh, that, it, that the outlook is so poor for so many of these kids has to do with how we as a society respond to kids who are challenged. And um, as the New York, New York Times article says, um, this boy was intellectually impaired and at high risk for a range of secondary disabilities including poor judgment impulsive behavior, social isolation, limited uh, academic achievement, unemployment, drug and alcohol abuse, imprisonment, mental health problems, including uh, suicidal ideation, inability to live independently, and inappropriate sexual behavior. Now, of course, as Natalie pointed out, there's lots of other people in our society and lots of other kids who are also at risk for pre impulse control, inappropriate sexual behavior, imprisonment, um, poor acad academic achievement, unemployment, and social ostracization. So that's not restricted to the fetal alcohol, fetal alcohol spectrum. The simple understanding, of course, in North America is that a woman drinks during pregnancy, the kid is damaged by the alcohol, bad woman, poor kid. So that we judge the woman as having done something bad to an unborn child. And then we pity the child, but we have little understanding of what that child actually needs because we think that the damage is due to the alcohol and what can you do about it anyway? Now, as always, the simple answer or well, the simplistic answer is not the appropriate answer. And as uh, Natalie indicated in the introduction, there's another way to look at things, which is the only way to understand any human being and any human activity and any human problem, which is to recognize it in context, which is to recognize the connections between people, the connections between phenomena and the interaction of the individual with the social environment. We have an interesting situation in Canada, interesting in a rather tragic way, I should say, <clears throat> in that, of course, in the First Nations communities, the fetal alcohol problem is more prevalent than it is in uh, other parts of society. We also have, by the way, uh, the dubious statistic I say dubious, morally dubious, but unfortunately true, statistic that a proportionately, a disproportionately large number of people who are addicted come from First Nations backgrounds and the ones who end up in jail. So that in some of the federal jails in Canada, the majority or close to, a, close, close to majority of the inmates are actually of First Nations origin, whereas of course, they make up only a small percentage of the Canadian population in the downtown east side where I worked for 12 years. 
uh, about 30% of my clients at least would have been First Nations, whereas again, they only make up two or three percent of the Canadian population. And of course, we can say, well, you know, that's just a drunken Indian for you. And that's the phrase that we use, isn't it? Now, then we assume that these people are either um, somehow flawed morally or intellectually. They're just not thinking on their feet, so they drink too much, making a bad choice. Or we might, with a bit more compassion, say, oh, geez, it's too bad. Genetically, they're just predisposed to drink. Poor people, what a shame. But here's the thing that knocks both of those ideas out of the water as soon as you think about it. Before the coming of the Caucasians, there were addictive substances or substances that were potentially addictive in North America. There was, of course, tobacco. There was peyote. There were psychedelic plants. And in some areas of North America, there were alcoholic spirits. Not only did these substances exist, they were also known to the natives. And not only were they known to the natives, they were used by them. But how were they used? They were used ceremonially. They were used spiritually. They were used to take the consciousness to a higher level, which is the very opposite of addiction. The, uh, the essence of addiction is to bring your consciousness to a lower level so that you don't feel what you don't want to feel. So addiction, including drinking, is an escape. The person who drinks doesn't choose, really, uh, to be dependent on alcohol. I'm talking about the people that drink too much. People drink because they don't like how they feel. People actually drink because they don't enjoy the state of their mind, which is to say the state of their brain. It's too uncomfortable for them. So the, the use of drugs, <clears throat> any mind-altering substance, unless in the exceptional ceremonial context, under the guidance of elders and tradition and ceremony and ritual, except in those circumstances, the use of substances is pretty much always there because you don't like the way you are or feel or think and you want to change your brain chemistry so that you, you alter the state of your mind. And so if you want to understand why people want to alter the state of their minds, you, it's not enough to talk about genetics, is it? If the problem was genetic, and since that there were all these substances here before, the coming of the Caucasians, there should have been a lot of addictions in our first patient population before the colonial arrival. But there wasn't any addiction. Therefore, we know that it can't be genetic. We also can begin to see that it's not a matter of choice. Because if it's a matter of choice, why didn't you choose it before? Instead of using these substances ceremonially with respect in healing, like tobacco was a healer. And tobacco is still used by peoples all around the world, in Latin America, for example, as a healing plant, not as something to escape uh, reality from. So we can understand that our quick judgments about these people somehow have made a bad choice, they're stupid, or that they're genetically just susceptible and therefore what can you do? These ideas don't stand up to any kind of scrutiny. And if we actually want to understand why is it that people wish to alter the states of their mind and the chemical balance of their brains through the use of chemicals, we have to ask a simple question. What do the substances do? What do the substances do? Well, basically, what alcohol does is it suppresses one chemical in the brain and enhances another one. And the one that it suppresses is called glutamate and it's responsible for the uh, excitation of nerve cells in the brain. And the one that it enhances is called uh, GABA or gamma, gamma amino butyric acid, GABA, which inhibits, slows things down. 
So the person who drinks wants to slow things down, wants to upturn themselves, wants to feel numbed out. In fact, what do we say about somebody who's drunk too much? We say, oh, he's feeling no pain. So the, so the urge to drink, especially in high quantities, is actually a desire to get away from pain. And if that is the case, then the question we have to ask is, not why the alcohol or why the drug, but why the pain? And now if we understand that question, we can't look at genetics or, cho or choices, because nobody chooses to be in pain, and there's no genetic predisposition to pain. What there is, is people's life experience. In short, the answer to the dilemma of drinking or any other substance use can only come if we examine people's lives. <laughs> now, once we start to examine people's lives, of course, we have to look at the larger picture. Because no baby is born independently or could survive independently. Children are born into a culture. They're born into a society. They're born into an economic situation. They're born into a whole set of circumstances which they didn't choose and over which they have no control. So therefore, if we understand the experience of that child, you have to look at the society into which they're born and the history of that society and the current practices and mores and policies of that society. In short, we can't understand anything in isolation. We have to look at the connections. That's not a new idea. A teacher, the Buddha, 2,500 years ago, talked about the interconnected nature of phenomena. <clears throat> and this is what he said. Contemplate the nature of interconnected arising, which is that everything is caused by everything else, during every moment. When you look at a leaf or a raindrop, Meditate on all the conditions, near and distant, that have contributed to the presence of that leaf or raindrop. Know that the world is woven of interconnected strands. This is because that is. This is not because that is not. This is born because that is born. This dies because that dies. The birth and death of any phenomena are connected to the birth and death of all other phenomena. The one contains the many, and the many contains the one. Without the one, there cannot be the many, and without the many, there cannot be the one. Now, that wisdom of the interconnected of all, interconnection and the interconnected being of all phenomena and all creatures and all existence is, of course, not restricted to Buddhist thinking. It's a core uh, value uh, in, in native teachings as well, as you know. And the question we really have to ask is, how do we get from a situation? No, there was a study last year at Notre Dame University in the States. They looked at which societies are best at parenting. Which are the best societies for rearing children? <coughs> now, I... In recent years, I've been to a lot of First Nations communities across Canada, uh, here in BC as well. And I'm not saying this any way to blame, as I'll explain. I'm just describing. And what is true, and there's a lot of pain and trauma in these communities. And a lot of the pain and the trauma in these communities is inflicted by the adults on the children abuse and uh, neglect. And that's not unique to the native communities. We see it across the board. We see it in other parts of, the, uh, of society as well. But it's particularly endemic in na native communities. So when you look at that, it's a bit surprising to find out maybe that in this Notre Dame study, when they looked at the optimal environment for parenting, you know what they found? The optimal environment for parenting is the hunter-gatherer tribe which is to say the society that Native people here had before the coming of the, white, the, the Caucasians. In other words, they had the culture that was best designed to support healthy child development. And there's a number of reasons for that. Like one thing they didn't do is they didn't beat their kids. 
And when the Caucasians arrived in North America, they were the British, you know, they were kind of upset. The Puritans, you know, the Christians who came from England, they were, they were kind of upset at the natives at, at how they parented their kids. And you know why the Puritans were upset? Appalled, actually. They were surprised and kind of shocked because the natives didn't beat their kids. And to the Puritans, of course, you're supposed to beat your kids. If you spare the rod, you spoil the child. This is the, the ethic. So the, the idea of a culture that didn't beat their kids, they didn't understand that one. So on the other hand, <clears throat> Native people carried their kids everywhere they went. So the kids were never put down. They were never left alone. They were not isolated in kindergartens. They were not left to cry if they were upset. They were picked up right away. In other words, they, they, they parented with absolute intuitive, instinctual, nurturing parenting practices. So not only is it not true that Native people don't know how to parent, the fact is how they parent that is superior to the way that most parenting happens in our culture. Because in our culture, we separate adults from kids, and it's still quite okay to spank a child. And if a child cries, we actually tell parents, don't pick them up, you're just going to spoil them. Just the opposite of what the kid actually needs. So if you want to understand how did we go from a culture that parented in the optimal way to something that we see all too often now in First Nations communities where children are hurt or at least not getting their needs met, we can't understand it if you only look at that culture in isolation. We have to take a really close look at their relationship to the culture that took over here. And, of course, I don't know that I have to tell this audience the history of what happened in this country, but I'll say more about it later. But what I am saying now is that if one understand why people are drinking, it's because they're in pain. And if we understand why they're in pain, we have to understand their life history. The life history, not just as individuals, but also the life history as a society. And again, nothing that I'm saying is unique to First Nations peoples, but the suffering and the pain and the historical trauma is more concentrated in those communities than is anywhere else. And didn't create their own trauma. That happened at the hands of other people. And now, who are we then, or who's anybody, to point fingers and say, you drink too much, you hurt your kid? We don't understand that. We really have to look at the history of this country and also the present of this country. Now, Specifically, when it comes to women drinking, if a guy drinks, well, that's too bad, but the kid is not going to happen with, with fetal alcohol syndrome. But as Natalie said, the woman's drinking is not separate from the man's drinking. In fact, very often, it's a relationship, right? Furthermore, there's an interesting statistic. Uh, well, if you look at a whole range of diseases, uh, autoimmune diseases, for example, autoimmune diseases where the immune system attacks the body itself. 120 years ago, there was no autoimmune disease in native communities, none whatsoever. And now they have some of the world's highest rates of rheumatoid arthritis and autoimmune disease in general. 120 years ago, there was no diabetes in First Nations communities. But now, in some areas of Canada, we have some of the world's highest rates of diabetes. Can't be purely genetic. If it was, it should have happened a long time before. Something must have happened. Specifically when you look at women, and women are at a higher risk for autoimmune disease, and also for like rheumatoid arthritis, and also for non-smoking related cancer. What's really going on is that, again, you can't isolate the women from the society that they live in. And I'm talking about women in general, not just Native women. In the 1940s, the ratio of multiple sclerosis 
was gender equal. So for every man diagnosed with multiple sclerosis, so was a woman. You know what the gender ratio now is in Canada? It's about three or four women to every man. Which right away, right away tells you that multiple sclerosis, this disease of the nervous system, can't be genetic. Because if it was, it wouldn't have changed over 70 years because genes don't change in a population over 70 years. It can't be the diet or the climate because that hasn't changed more for one gender than the other. What's happened? What's happened, of course, I believe, and this is what one of my books is about, is that disease has everything to do with stress. And the stress on women has increased. Now, why has the stress on women increased when we have washing machines and dishwashers and all this kind of stuff, <laughs> you know? And then the more, you know, the more gadgets we get and the more, you know, labor-saving devices, the more busy and the more stressed we get. Because number one, women are still carrying out their roles as the emotional absorbers of their families. So that it's the woman who still absorbs the stress of the male. Automatically. It's just like an unspoken deal. Okay, kid, I'll marry you, says the guy, and your job is to absorb my stresses. And when you get tired of doing that, or too, or too smart to do it, I'll find a younger woman who will do it again for me. You know? <laughs> Basically, that's the deal. And the women go, yeah, that's great, fantastic, I'll, I'll do that. But in addition to that traditional role, women also have to play an economic role now. Role now because uh, families need the income. And third, there's less support. There's less support because the community and the clan and the tribe that the Aboriginal people here had and that people everywhere used to have has been by civilization and industrialization completely destroyed. So people are much more isolated than they used to be. There's less social cohesion. There's less community. There's less contact, communication. There's less mutual support. So now we have more stress and less support. Well, no wonder then that women have more multiple sclerosis now. It's the same with drinking. So again, if a woman drinks, is that her individual problem? Or does that reflect, and this is true for men too, but I'm just talking about women right now. Or does that reflect a history of pain, maybe trauma, a real discomfort with the self, and a lot of stress. And if it, and if, if it reflects all that, then it's no longer an individual problem, is it? Again, now we have to look at the whole social picture, which we as a society don't like very much to do. Now, if you look at addiction in general, there's been large-scale studies now. Well, I can tell you in the downtown east side, where my patients are addicted to heroin or cocaine or alcohol or a whole bunch of things at the same time, over a 12-year period, I didn't have a single female patient who had not been sexually abused as a child. Now, if you look at most women who are drinking enough to cause severe FASD in their kids, you're not going to find a single one who wasn't traumatized as a child. So what's actually happening is that in the woman's drinking, or the man's, but we're speaking about women now, the woman's drinking in adulthood, we actually see the impact of her own childhood. And if she was traumatized as a child, why was she traumatized? Because her parents had too much pain and trauma in their lives, and they acted it upon their kids. So in the woman's drinking, we're seeing the childhoods of her parents and of their parents before them. It's not an individual problem. It's a multi-generational problem. The pain is passed on until we somehow deal with it. And surely, this conference is, is, is an attempt to somehow break that link of suffering, break that chain of suffering.
separate the links so that the chain does not go on enslaving generation upon generation. But that's what we're looking at. We're not looking at individual choices or failures. We're looking at multi-generational problems here. And that's not only my experience. That's also what the studies show. And this is where it gets a bit frustrating because the studies that I'm telling you about or will tell you about are not controversial and they're not secret. I mean, they're published in major medical and psychological journals. But most practitioners don't know about them. Most practitioners don't know about them. Now, one set of studies in particular are called the Adverse Childhood Experiences Studies, ACE, or Adverse Childhood Experience. An Adverse Childhood Experience is physical, sexual, or emotional abuse, the loss of a parent through death, through being jailed, or a rancorous divorce, um, violence in a family, addiction, mental illness in a family. You can actually go on the internet and download the ACE score and do your own and see where you're at. It'll explain a lot of what your experience in life has been about. Because the adverse childhood experiences study clearly show, looking at tens of thousands of people, that for each of these events or set of events, the risk of drinking goes up exponentially, the risk of drug use goes up exponentially, the risk of obesity goes up exponentially, the risk of psychosis goes up exponentially, of mental illness in general, of criminality, of relationship problems, of diabetes, of strokes, of cancer, and a whole range of other problems. In other words, none of those things that we tend to think about as just a problem of the individual are problems of the individual. Even cancer is not a problem of the individual. Cancer reflects multi-generational history and childhood experience. Not that most physicians have any clue as to why that's the case. But in Canada, it's been shown that if you were abused as a child, your risk of cancer goes up 50%. In other words, your cancer is a manifestation of what happened to your grandparents. Because that's where you were abused. Because something happened in the family or to the family. It's the same with alcoholism, same with drinking, same with all substance-related behaviors. So that to understand what happens to one generation, you have to understand what happened to the previous one. And then how that generation treated the next one. This stuff is passed on. And we don't pass it on deliberately. We just do. It's just how it is. We can't help it. Until we deal with it, we just pass it on. It's just, there's no way around it. Now, there's a psychiatrist in the States called Dr. Bessel van der Kolk, who is at Boston University, and he deals a lot with trauma. And he's actually proposing something here. He's saying that we have all these diagnoses, you know, ADHD, and I'll, I'll be talking more about ADHD tomorrow. Uh, and I have it myself, by the way, um, which is why I like a lapel mic and I like to move around on stage. Um, oppositional defiant disorder, you know, conduct disorders, uh, Asperger's, Tourette's, all these things. And we think, you know, we've diagnosed a kid with ADHD, now we've explained something. Or no, it's, it's, not, it's, not, it's not ADHD, it's Asperger's. Well, that explains it. None of that explains anything. It only describes it. These diagnoses are not real entities in the real world. They're just stuff that we've put together to describe things. Now we think we've explained something. And FASD is the same thing. Now, what Van der Kolk says is that instead of all these different diagnoses, there's only one diagnosis, which is what he calls developmental trauma disorder. And that simply means that human beings develop an interaction with the environment. Not a big surprise, is it? If you had a garden in which the plants weren't developing properly uh, and they weren't growing as well or maybe they were deformed or somehow, you could have the option of going out there and yelling at them, like we do with kids. 
You know, grow up. <laughs> What's wrong with you? Look at that. You're crooked. Straighten up already. What, look at your posture. <laughs> or we could recognize that if those plants weren't developing properly, there's something wrong with the environment. We wouldn't, be looking, we wouldn't be asking what's wrong with the plant. We'd be asking what conditions for development is that plant not receiving? Nutrition, soil, irrigation, sunlight. Well, now, we now know from decades of scientific research that the human personality and the human brain itself, the physiology of the human brain itself, develops in interaction with the environment. And for the right kind of development, you need the right kind of conditions. Now, I'll be speaking a lot more about that tomorrow in my workshop on ADHD and, and, and FASD. But to, to make a long story short, the essential, the essential condition for the proper development of brain circuits, brain circuits that govern our behavior and our emotional life, so brain circuits that govern our capacity to regulate our impulses so that we're not acting out all the time, brain circuits that regulate our capacity to balance ourselves emotionally so we don't get too upset when something happens, so we can handle it. Brain circuits that handle our capacity to respond to stress. And other important, to pay attention. All these important brain circuits need the right environment. And the essential condition is a non-stress, supportive parenting environment. Now if we look at society as a whole, and we see all these kids who are diagnosed with oppositionality, conduct disorders, ADHD, Tourette's, Asperger's, autism, all that, they all have stuff in common. What they have in common is poor impulse control, poor emotional self-regulation. So when they get upset, they show, they show tantrums. They can't stop themselves. Poor social cues, they, don't, they can't read social cues very well. In other words, all the things that FASD kids don't have either. And in all these other cases, we're not saying it's because the mother drank too much, because the mother didn't drink. What happened was that those children were born to stressed parents under stressed circumstances. And in those conditions, the brain didn't develop properly. They couldn't develop properly. Now. If you look at FASD kids, what do we see? Not only do we see that the mothers may have drunk uh, excessively during pregnancy, but if we ask, why did those women drink? Well, we've already answered that. It's because the woman was in pain emotionally, and she needed to soothe the pain with the drink. In other words, she's a stressed woman. She has a lifelong history of, of distress. And she's in a distressful situation right now. Maybe she's in a relationship where she's being beaten. Maybe she's in a relationship where she's not being supported. Maybe she's living with an alcoholic male. Maybe she's all isolated. In other words, she's very, very stressed. But I can tell you already, and I'll say much more about it tomorrow, stress on a woman during pregnancy has an impact on the developing nervous system of the child. Physiologically. So studies have shown that women who are stressed during pregnancy, their kids will have behavior problems at age three or four. Animals who are stressed during pregnancy, their offspring will be more likely to use cocaine and alcohol as adults. Much more evidence that we shall present tomorrow. But what's obvious here and what's evident is that any woman who drinks is by definition a stressed woman. Not only that, I'll say more about this tomorrow, but again, stress in the first few years of life interferes with the development of the child's brain also. Now, any child born into a family where there is drinking in the family is born into a stress situation by definition. How do we know what is the effect of stress on the developing brain and what is the effect of alcohol? Well, in the case of the kids who've got the facial markings or the brain scan findings or the heart difficulty, or heart abnormalities, and so on, caused by the toxin, alcohol, well, you can clearly say that's the alcohol. 
But what about the many kids with the fetal alcohol and spectrum disorder who don't have any of the physical markings at all? Can we say for sure that it's all because of the alcohol? Or is a lot of it perhaps due to the stress on the parenting environment? Now here's the good news though. The good news is the part that's due to the stress is actually reversible. Those brain circuits can be rewired in the child. There's something called neuroplasticity, which is the capacity of the brain to develop new circuits even later on in life. And that capacity is with us all our lives. And we know this from animal studies and human experience, that the brain can rewire. We can see this on brain scans. We can see it on, we can see it on autopsies. So if you give people the right conditions, in fact, you know something? Even those infants who are born with physical brain damage can develop new circuits later on in life. Studies in California have shown this. You take rats and you deliberately brain damage them at birth, but then you expose them to an environment that's supportive and nourishing, they'll actually do a whole lot better. You can take mice where you've knocked out one of their genes that supports learning, but if you give them the right environment, you'd never know that that gene wasn't active in them. They'd learn just as well as other mice. In other words, there's much more capacity for repair and new development and new functions to arise in the human brain than we actually uh, often credit. But what does that depend on? Well, just like the plant, it depends on the environment. So the key question is, how do we give kids the right kind of environment? And never mind giving up on anybody. Because you never know how much development they're capable of until you give them a the right environment. Now, the right environment, of course, involves a lot of loving and nurturing. It does not involve fancy techniques, necessarily. It does not involve uh, a whole lot of technology. It involves lots of unconditional loving attention. And that's what this dog did for this kid. And uh, the, the point that they make in this article, and this dog is the only creature in that boy's life who does not react negatively when the kid acts out. In fact, he's trained to get in there and even he can pick up when the kid is going to act out. He's, he, he senses it and gets in there and, and, and tries to cheer, cheer the kid up. And, you know, it's amazing. And as the article points out, that when the human brain can relax, then it can learn. So that for learning, you have to have a sense of comfort and safety. And when you've got your, 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 your emotional needs met, and you're loved, and you're accepted, <coughs> then your brain can relax and it can actually take on the task of learning, acquiring new information and incorporating that new information. So even this heavily, heavily challenged little boy who is severely physically affected by the uh, alcohol, even in him, the presence of the dog has meant a completely new lease on life. And he'll always be challenged, but but there's capacities in him that nobody would ever known that he had if this dog had been brought into his life, especially a trained dog, by the way. But what the dog can provide is, of course, what ideally human beings could also provide if we weren't screwed up, all of us, <laughs> which is this unconditional loving acceptance and, it's, and, and, and the sense of intuitive connection. So that's what these kids need. That's also what the women need who drink. Because again, their drinking is no accident. And that caused me, finally, <clears throat> to look at the larger picture again. And that larger picture again is Canadian society. Now, a few years ago, our current prime minister apologized for the residential schools. You know, I think I have heard everything in the downtown east side and, and, and do my travels, but then something happens and I think, this is impossible. So let me tell you a little story. So last year, about a year ago, I was working with uh, one of the native bands in BC, the Seashell Band, 
and I was working with a Peruvian plant called ayahuasca, which is a healing plant, one of these healing plants. It's a hallucinogen, ooh, it gives you visions. <laughs> healing visions. And we had a Peruvian shaman working with us, and I was working with supporting that work. And of course, we were dealing with people who are addicted, women who are heavily into cocaine, the men who are into alcohol, or both, or women, and you know, just heavily addicted uh, group of people. And I, I initiated this discussion about, look, well, let's just go, what happened to you in life? So one woman in her 50s told me that in residential school, when she was four years old, and, I, and some of you would have heard these stories, but to me it was a shock. I thought I'd heard everything. I hadn't. When she spoke her native language, you know what they did? The nuns put a, stuck a pin in her tongue to give her pain so as to f make her forget her language. Now, of course, that means she had to sit there the whole hour. Ah, yes. Because if she put her tongue back in her mouth, she would cut her lips or the inside of her mouth. This happened in this province, in this country, within the lifetime of many people in this room. And then we talk about drunken Indians. Then we say, why are they doing this to their kids? You know? And so when this apology came from Mr. Harper, well, that was a good thing. At least they acknowledged what happened. But it's not enough. In fact, I rather thought that the apology was meaningless. The reason it was meaningless is because it's not enough to apologize for something if you're going to keep doing the same thing. Now, it's not that we have residential schools in this country anymore. No, that we don't. So we can safely apologize for that. But we haven't apologized for yet. It is the destruction of people's ways of life. The destruction of the, the attempted, not successful, thank God, but the attempted discussion, the destruction of their culture and the robbery of their resources. And why we have no apologies for that? Because we're still doing it. Look right now, this northern pipeline that they want to build. The native communities across the north are lining up to, uh, to oppose it, to express their concerns for their children for the possible toxic effect, for the destruction, further destruction of the ways of life. And our government says that these people who are saying those things are just foreign agitators. But what does it mean to apologize when you're still going to rob people of what belongs to them? And when you continue to make their lives miserable, then what do we expect except more addiction? And what's our government's response to that? to the addiction problem and to the fact that people are going to drink and break the law is to spend billions of dollars more in jails. So the same government that doesn't have the money for social services and wants to raise the, the rage for um, old age pensions because, you know, to save money, what we do have money for is to build more jails and to keep people in jail longer by toughening up the uh, criminal code. And who's going to end up in those jails? Let me read you a paragraph from my book on addiction. Detective Sergeant Paul Gillespie, head of Toronto's sex crimes unit, rescued children from the purveyors of internet pornography. That's what he did. He rescued these kids that were being abused on the internet. As the Global Mail reported on his retirement from police work, six years at that job, had not inured him to the horrors that he witnessed. Paul Gillespie still can't get used to the sounds of crying and pain, says the Globe article, and the graphic videos of children being raped and molested that he has seen all too often on the web. It's beyond horrible to listen to the soundtracks of these movies, said Canada's best-known child porn cop. But it is the silent images of desolate children that tear most at his heart. They're not screaming, just accepting, he said, of the infants captured in his pictures. They have dead eyes. You can tell that their spirit is broken. That's their life. He's talking about two-year-olds. <laughs> Those two-year-olds are going to end up drinking and using drugs. And if that same policeman, think about this one, 
if that same policeman, instead of quitting the force, transferred to the drug squad, who do you think he'd be chasing in the streets? Those children that he didn't rescue. Because they're the ones who become the addicts. They're the ones who become the alcoholics. So here we have uh, the paradox of uh, we try to protect and, and rescue kids from uh, trauma if we can. And if we can't, we put them in jail 20 years later. And this is what we call a civilized country. This is what we call the best country in the world to live in. For who? Not for the vulnerable. Not for the people that um, suffer the multigenerational trauma of what this history, our history, has imposed on them. Well, there's good news in all this. <clears throat> the good news is that children's brains are malleable and plastic, even adults' brains, so that if we actually can create the conditions for the healthy development, that development will take place. And a lot more kids can do a whole lot better if we get all that. If we don't just dismiss them as this diagnosis and that diagnosis, and that means it's hopeless. Because none of these conditions are written in stone, and even as much about FASD that's reversible. I'm not dismissing here the toxic effect of alcohol. I'm just saying there's a lot there besides that, and that's what Natalie said in the first place, that there's a lot of continuity between these conditions and a lot of similarity, and so that the approach has to be also similar, which is to recognize that underlying all of them, including fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, there's a lot of childhood uh, stress and trauma, multi-generational. And if we go to work on supporting these families and helping these families and helping these children and in our schools and kindergartens and institutions, and especially if, if we ever had the wisdom to stop spending the money in the utterly inhumane and non-productive and from every angle useless, worse than useless, criminalization of people who use substances because they're too much in pain, well, we could actually get somewhere. And finally, when I look at the qualities or the teachings of traditional cultures around the world, whether in Peru or in North America or in Canada or in BC, what do we find? We see a recognition of the interconnection of things. We see the importance of connection to the land, of being grounded. We see the importance of nature. We see forgiveness. We see witnessing of one another's pain. We see listening. We, need, we see inclusion. We see restorative justice. We see ceremony. We see communal chanting and, and, and the creation of, of, of communal spaces. In other words, all the qualities necessary for healing are actually present in traditional teachings. So I think that for us to help heal the ones who most need it, but also for us to heal as a society, we need to drop the arrogance that science somehow will give us the answers. That realize that the answers have been here with us all along. We just haven't paid attention to them. And if we did, uh, our whole society would be much more happy and much more humane. Thank you. If I could live my life over again, I'd live it very differently. You know, if I could parent them again, I'd, I'd not be the same person. Because although I didn't have an alcohol or any substance addiction, I was a workaholic. And I wasn't around for my kids emotionally. And you don't have to have alcohol or a substance to be addicted to in order to hurt your kids. All you have to do is to be emotionally absent. So this issue of parental guilt and caregiver guilt, I mean, I deal with it. Because my kids got issues. As adults, they have issues. And uh, those issues, I know, would not be there had I been a different parent. That's just the reality. That's how it is. But if I look at it objectively, did I choose to be that way, or is there something driving me that I wasn't aware of? Maybe I had some pain that I was trying to drown through my work. Maybe I felt 
not wanted in this world because of stuff that happened to me early in life. And then my way of compensating was to make myself a really busy doctor. So people would then want my services. They didn't want me, at least they want my services. So I did that. But as a result, my kids didn't get the attention they needed. Now, guilt. Was I guilty of anything? No, I did my best given who I was, but that's who I was. That's the first point. The second point is that, well, the second point is simply that people do do their best. And we are human beings. And so, you know, we have all this love and, and, and uh, compassion in our hearts, but sometimes we don't project that. Sometimes we project impatience or frustration or anger or even rejection. And we don't mean to. That's not our intention, it's just how we're wired. Not that we're born that way, but that's how we became wired. So until we overcome our wiring, until we overcome our childhood programming, we're still gonna make mistakes, and we're still gonna do stuff that's going to uh, even hurt the people that we're actually trying to help. You might as well accept that, that's how it is. It's not your personal problem, it's not your fault. It's not individual to you, it's not personal to you. That's just who we are as human beings. So if you're going to feel guilt, well, just realize that you're a human being. And, and that's where all this comes from. And the fact is that whoever is asking this question, I have no doubt that you're doing your best at any given moment. But your best is limited by who you are, by your own programming, and all the stuff that's happened to you, and by the stresses that you're under right now. So cut yourself some slack here. And furthermore, th there's a worse thing about guilt, which is that when we look at our kids and we feel guilty, we're actually not seeing their possibilities. We're only seeing their problems. And for parents, that's very tempting. When I look at my kids, I see their problems. Other people look at them, what wonderful kids you got, you know? Who are you talking about? <laughs> but as uh, parents and caregivers, we tend to see the problems because it's our job to deal with them and also we tend to see our responsibility. We don't see the possibility. So, and there's a final thing I'd say about guilt, which is that whoever feels guilty today as a caregiver, that guilt is not new. You felt guilty before your child ever came into the world. The guilt is just yours. And most of the time we feel guilty, it's because as children we learn to feel guilty because we failed at the most important thing that uh, we took on, which is impossible. And we feel guilty because our parents were not happy. And, our, and the child can only take that personally. So if my parents are not happy, the kid can only say, well, something's wrong with me, so it's my fault. So your guilt in the present has got nothing to do with your child. It has to do with your parents. And you know what? You never could make them happy because it wasn't your job. Only they could make themselves happy. And if they couldn't do that, you couldn't do it for them. But as a result, you develop this guilt of failure and you're responsible. And now you're projecting that guilt onto your child, of course, and, and, or your relationship with your child. So for all these reasons, notice the guilt. Just say hello to it, but don't pay attention to it. It's not a particularly smart thing, Guild. Okay? Okay, next question. Um, hi. I have uh, two questions. Yeah. Start with the first one. Yeah. Um, when you compare, like, for example, two siblings that were raised by the same parents, and, um, you know, it was, it was pretty fair. The parents yeah. were fair with both of them. Yeah. Um, how would you explain one suffering with addictions and right. pain and trauma and the other one doing absolutely fine. Sure. It's because your, your question is a good one and a very common one. It's an important one. It also contains a fallacy. You said when you look at two kids who were raised by the same parents, there's no two kids who were ever raised by the same two parents. Okay? No two children ever had the same two parents. Now let me give you an example for my family, which I talk about in my book, Scattered Minds. Okay? Just to give you an illustration of it. So I was born in Budapest, Hungary, 1944. Jewish parents, Second World War, Nazi occupation. Can you imagine what first year I had? Can you imagine the stresses my mother was under? Her parents were killed in Auschwitz. 
my husband, uh, my husband, my father, her husband, my father was away in forced labor. She didn't know if he was dead or alive. That was my first year. My, my next brother was born in 1946. My father had come back. It was peacetime. It was a time of optimism, rebuilding. My third brother, or the third of us brothers, was born. His name is not Mate. His name is Mate. Because he was born in Canada. None of this European stuff. George Mate, who is now 50. He was born in 58, so however that makes him. 54 years old this year. He's, you know, he, he's got a tattoo on his shoulder, which he put on just this year as a 53-year-old. <laughs> and uh, and it's, got, uh, the Vancouver, it's got the Vancouver Canucks logo. <laughs> and I said, George, tell me this is just a paint-on job. He said, no, it's real, he says. And when we win the cup, it's going on, the cup is going on the other arm. <laughs> But we're still waiting for that tattoo. <laughs> but he was born in 58 in Canada to a mother who was then 39, a father who was 48, new immigrants in Canada, not speaking the language, trying to make their life in a new culture, struggling economically. Do you think the three brothers had the same parents? Can you see that they didn't? Mm -hmm. It's the same with all other kids, okay? So children are, are never born to the same parents because the parents are at a different stage of their relationship, a different stage of their uh, life, different stresses. Um, and not only that, each kid evokes something different from a parent. So even though I love my kids the same, mm -hmm. and I might be fair in terms of what kind of goods I give them or what kind of rules I set down for them and all that, but emotionally, I react to them differently because they trigger a different part of me because they're different people. Mm -hmm. So they don't experience me as the same at all. And furthermore, even if I could be the same person to them, which I can't be, even if I could be the same person, which I can't be, they would experience me differently because they have this sens different sensibilities. Yeah. They experience the world differently. The same piece of food doesn't taste the same to them. They're different people. The same father, even if he could be the same father, which he can't be, but even if he could be, he would be experienced myself, by them as somewhat different. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter what I am. What matters is their experience of me. So their experience of me is vastly different. So it's simply not true to say. And not only that, like if, if I look at my two boys, who are three and a half years apart, the older one, Daniel, <clears throat> He's the one that fought back all the time. And, you know, we weren't great parents in, in significant ways. And he fought back, and he argued, and he yelled. And, you know, now the younger one saw all this fighting, and he said, I don't want any part of this. So his, his, his way was to blend in and not to make trouble. So they didn't, bring up, they didn't grow up in the same family. That's my answer. Thank you. OK, you're welcome. I have another one. Yeah, sure. <laughs> um, you know, when you were talking about unconditional love? Yeah. Um, well, there's a... What I want to know is, would you consider, like, um, <clears throat> therapy and forgiveness and all that being a way to take care of, like, um, the hurt and the guilt that we have to, um, after that, be able to... Go in unconditional love. Well, no, hold on. Um, <laughs> you said something and forgiveness. What's the first word you said? Um, like therapy, like therapy and. Um, Th oh, therapy. Yeah. Therapy. Is it? Okay, yeah. So, ask your question again, would you? Sorry for my no, accent. No, no, that's quite all right. No, no, no. I, I just want to really make sure I grasp it. Well, what I mean is, you know, like well, I'm going to start. Are, are you saying that if you didn't get conditional love, then yeah. couldn't you get it? by going through therapy and all that and, and, and forgiving. And all. Is that what you're asking? Yeah. So if, if it wasn't there for you in the first place, can you get it in the second place? Exactly, because okay. at some point you said, right. we can't go around it. Right. That was interesting. Right, got it. Well, here's the thing. Why there's can't good, we go there, around there, it? There's good news and bad news. <laughs> there's bad news and good news. The bad news is that whatever happened in the past, you can't get it. Mm -hmm. If you didn't get unconditional love as a kid from your parents, you're never going to be a kid who gets unconditional love from their parents. 
I mean, even if your parents, now that you're an adult, could give you unconditional love, it still wouldn't mean anything that much. Well, it would matter a lot, but it wouldn't restore what they didn't give you then. That's the bad news, okay? But there's good news. The good news is that the big problem isn't how much your parents loved you or they didn't. The problem is that because they couldn't love you the way you needed to be, you lost touch with yourself. That's the good news. Do you see why that's good news? Because you can, you can take control now. You can, you can get in touch with yourself again. Okay, so let me read you a quote by a teacher that I think is great. He says, the fundamental thing that happened and the greatest calamity is not that there was no love or support. The greater calamity, which was caused by that first calamity, is that you lost the connection to your own essence. That is much more important than whether or not your mother f or father loved you. So, because, no, it's not that I didn't love my kids, but love is not, the love that the child needs is not the emotion that the parent experiences. The love that the child needs is being accepted unconditionally and being understood. And whatever love I felt for my kids, which is a lot, it didn't translate into unconditional acceptance and seeing them for who they were because I wasn't capable of that because I, I didn't have that kind of relationship with myself. Mm -hmm. So I couldn't do that. So when the child isn't seen and understood and accepted, then they don't see themselves. They don't understand themselves. They don't know and accept themselves. That's the big tragedy. Otherwise, it wouldn't matter. But the good news is that that's in the, that you can reconnect. We can come to understand ourselves, accept ourselves, and honor ourselves in the present. And when we're able to do that, then what happened 20 years ago or 30 years ago just doesn't matter anymore. So the answer is yes for that reason. Okay? Thank you. You're welcome. Hi. Good evening. I want to say thank you for coming. I'm honored to listen to you speak tonight, thank doctor. You. Um, very engaging speaker, and you have a lot of interesting perspectives on things. Um, I'd like to know um, from your perspective, your idea. Um, we talk about FASD um, being rampant in a lot of First Nations communities, and um, for us who are frontline workers, service providers working with these people, whom we see briefly, we may only see, see a glimpse of, um, what can we do to best support these people in helping to break that cycle? And the second part to that question is, what is your vision in, um, I don't want to say curing, but um, eliminating the pain and the trauma for these people? Well, um, you can't eliminate it if it happened. You can uh, do your best so that it isn't passed on. That's what you mean, I suppose, that it's not passed on from to future generations. I think that um, a lot of, this is my perception from the outside, and I could be corrected on this, <clears throat> but my perception is that a lot of necessary energy in First Nations communities has gone to trying to get redress from governments, treaty rights, and redress for past wrongs and all that, and that's important work. But that's not going to finish anytime soon. That struggle is going to go on for a long time yet just because governments aren't ready to, uh, to do what's right. And they're not ready to do what's right because the economic stakes are too high. So that struggle is going to go on for a long, long time yet. It's a necessary one. But there's work inside the communities that need to take place. And I think that the communities have to deal with the trauma. They got to deal with it openly. They got to start talking about it. Not just the trauma that was inflicted on them by the residential schools. Yes, that needs to be talked about loudly and much more clearly. People need to hear each other's stories and witness each other's experience. That's important. But also as the, but we also need to talk about the trauma that as a result of that first trauma is now being passed on within the communities by community members onto each other. Now if we don't confront that issue, nothing's gonna happen. 
the, the biggest um, barrier to that happening, I think, is the tremendous shame that's around that. You know, you're ashamed if you're an abuse of sexual, sorry, you're ashamed if you're a victim of sexual abuse, and you're ashamed if you're a perpetrator of it. Now, of course, it needs to be understood that the victim is completely not at fault. It needs to be also understood that the perpetrator is also not at fault. <clears throat> because the perpetrator is the victim themselves who just unconsciously acted out their pain on some other person. So we have to depersonalize it. We have to take the shame away. And we have to be open about what happened and what's happening. So it's a, it's a long discussion now we could embark upon in response to your question. But the, I think the fundamental issue is you've got to look at how it is and talk about it openly and publicly without blame, without pointing fingers. But as a necessary, as a necessary uh, step towards healing. And I think that this is where the traditions can be so strong. Because again, the tradition is all about restorative justice. It's about inclusion, not about exclusion. It's about forgiveness rather than punishment. So that has to be um, reinvigorated, that whole tradition. And then in the context of that tradition of acceptance and non-blame and non-punishment, the abuse and the traumatization has to be talked about openly. OK? Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Uh, my question is, um, um, like with a FAS, with a lot of alcoholism in the communities, and the cocaine use, mm -hmm. now there is um, prescript prescription drug abuse. There's yeah. a lot of um, gabapentin, gravel, <coughs> and um, Tylenol with codeine. That's a high rate of use in through through the pregnant, through mm. pregnancy. Mm. Um, is there any studies done on that? Or? Um, I'm not, you know, I didn't know that anybody uses gabapentin addictively. Are you saying that they do? Yeah, it's really high in the northern, northern communities, uh -huh. gabapentin. Okay. Uh, it's prescribed to people, to yeah. people that have, um, Kind of like um, cancer symptoms or, um, or nerve nervous, pain, nerve, nerve pain. pain. Yeah, sure. Or a rage. Yeah, you know, I, I, I knew that. I just didn't know and, it. Uh, it was used addictively. Okay, well. The very use, the very use of it is like from a from a ten year old to an elder. And the thing about it is, um, I work in a school. I'm a school counselor at Eugene Joseph School. The thing about it is, um, these little kids is grade two. I, We'll be flipping a magazine and we'll be looking for stuff, and they'll identify these drugs. Mm. You know, they'll just say, "Oh, my my grandma takes this, or my brother takes this." Mm -hmm. So it's really high, and there's a lot of um, like they kind of like they quit using alcohol, and now they're using sure. These. So your question is, what is the impact of that on the ch on the on the developing child? Is that what the question is? Yeah. Okay. Well. First of all, um, what your question points out is something about something that I talk about addiction in this book here and in the realm of hunger ghosts, in that addiction is not to a particular substance. I mean, it is and it isn't. There's an underlying addiction process that has to do with emotional pain, spiritual emptiness. Uh, brain circuits not wired exactly the right way because of early experience. And that's what creates the template for addiction. But just because you give up one addiction doesn't mean you've give up, given up addiction. It just means you've given up one particular form of it. Yeah. So, so typically, people who give up smoking will often put on weight because now they're trying to soothe through food that which before they were soothing through eating. So that's what you're describing. So that... The insufficiency of addiction treatment is that it focuses on abstention. But abstention is not the point. 
or it's not the only point. It's good, but it's not the only point. Because if you don't deal with the underlying issues that drove people into addiction in the first place, all that's going to happen is they're going to transfer their addictive drives onto other substances or other behaviors. And that's what you were describing. Now, secondly, I don't know what to say. I, you know what? For all the stuff you say about, not you say, but it's said about cocaine and its impact on babies, babies who are born to cocaine addicted like mothers do, do pretty well. And same with babies who are born to morphine addicted mothers or heroin addicted mothers, as long as the baby doesn't go withdra through withdrawal after birth, you know, from the opiate that you have to protect them from. They're not nearly as dangerous as alcohol is. I'm not advocating them. I'm just saying that uh, <laughs> they're not nearly as dangerous, so I'd be less worried about them than I'd be. I'd be, I'd be worried about all the other stuff, about all the stress and, 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 and the impact of that on the baby. But I'd be less worried about the substances. Gabapentin, I'd have to look up. I don't know what, what its effect is on, on a developing infant. OK? Yes, sir. Well, first of all, I'd like to congratulate you on a wonderful talk. Thank you presented a lot of uh, ideas. Uh, the uh, issues are very, very important, and I've had the pleasure or the um, difficulty with working in, um, with alcohol and alcohol-related problems probably from 1975 when I first spent some time with Dr. Smith that described the the syndrome, and I feel that I know less today than I thought I knew in 1975. That's good. <laughs> the difficulty comes in, and some of the newer uh, ideas and thoughts um, that are going on, I really never believed that alcohol was the cause of the problem. I'm still in the age of the fetal alcohol syndrome rather than the fetal alcohol effects. Mm -hmm. The Issues come in, and I find this every day when I'm in the office and working, is that I have groups of individuals both in my First Nations communities, and I worked in the First, Commun First Nations communities in the Northwest Territories, and here in British Columbia and in Alberta. And I find that there is truthfully a difference between, uh, I wish it was only environment that caused the the issues uh, that mm -hmm. do it. And what I find on a continuous basis is that uh, there is um, survivors, and the survivors many times have nothing to do with what has been done in the early uh, years, in the early formative years of the, of the child. And that's uh, what I sometimes take issue with that is probably going to cause me no end of grief in this next year in my office with uh, wanting to find programs of uh, how we can improve the nurturing of it. The unfortunate part is I have seen nurturing uh, in both ways, in the most uh, exquisite nurturing of a child and in the family and some of the most difficult nurturing uh, issues on it. And I don't um, uh, say that nurturing is the only uh, part of it. I hope that we don't go away from this and feel that there is going to be a, um, a cure by just nurturing for the effects of alcohol in, in utero. And I like that better of the effects of alcohol in utero than the fetal alcohol syndrome uh, because I think that there's something else that's affecting it. The difficulty that I have and that I have seen over the years is the effect of the alcohol on the infant when it is formed, unfortunately, and depending on the time sequence of the gestational development of the child, some of our mothers are affected by alcohol in their mothers. Mm -hmm. And that is the difficulty that I have that I, that I cannot resolve in my in my thoughts and my feelings. But I just hope that we don't, and the effect of the, of the sperm, we thought that the sperm had no effect, but now we know that four months before conception, the sperm has the, what the uh, sperm is bathed, bathed in does have an effect on, on the genetic development of the child. 
So I really don't think it is all environment, but that um, I strongly feel that some individuals have more, more of a predisposition due to their genetic uh, development to tolerate the effects of the toxins in pregnancy rather than just uh, the environment. Thank you for that very thoughtful um, commentary. Um, I'd like to respond by, first of all, agreeing with you that it's certainly not all the environment, and it can't be. And um, certainly I didn't mean to imply, and I hope you didn't hear me imply, that alcohol itself is not a toxin that also physiologically affects babies. Of course it does. And that's a major problem. Nor, do I, nor would I make an argument against genetic predispositions. Clearly, they're genetic predispositions, and they also play a role. However, I can't do anything about the effects of the toxic effects of alcohol. That's done. I can't do anything about genetic predisposition. That's also done. What I can do something about is the environment. And so why not concentrate on the part that's actually fixable, or at least where there's significant transformation can take place, as we know? That's my whole point. So it's not a matter of ignoring the factors that you articulate. It's that it's a question of where do we wish to focus our energies. And uh, furthermore, even genes, as you're probably aware, are turned on and off by the environment. So there was a study out of UBC uh, a few months ago that they looked at 150 genes in adolescents. 120 had been affected in their expression, in their function, by stresses on the mother in the child's first year or two of life. So the genetic function of teenagers was affected by stresses on the mother. And about 30 genes had been affected by stresses of the father in the, pre in, sorry, in the preschool years. So that a predisposition is not the same as a predetermination. So as long as we keep all that in mind, there's absolutely no disagreement between us. I am, again, just uh, interested in focusing on that part that we can most uh, effectively and positively work with. And that's all. And I think that certainly in medical practice uh, and in social policy, we've far too much ignored the environment. And we tend to respond only to uh, symptoms or to manifestations rather than underlying issues. And I, I can tell you that um, certainly with ADHD kids, and I also believe with, FAS, with fetal alcohol spectrum kids, the stress in a family not only help to create the problem in the first place, but also maintains it in the second place. So if I'm working with a family of a child with ADHD, it's not just a question of how do I change the child's brain chemistry through some stimulant, but also how do I help that family deal with the stresses that they're dealing with so that, that that's very sensitive child, who by the way is genetically probably hypersensitive and predisposed as a result to to, whatever, to, to suffer the effects of whatever happens, how would that sensitive child do we change the environment in the family itself so that although you can't undo the past, you can certainly work on the present. So that, that would be my response to your very appropriate um, and um, well put question. Yeah. Hi. Um, I just wanted to say thank you for, for this, what you've given us about being Aboriginal women and the history of our people and the struggles we've had. Because I think what you've said, we already know about. We knew about the way we used to parent a long time ago right. and how the changes have happened. I am a mother of six, and three of my children have been diagnosed with ARND. I drank in the beginning of my pregnancies. and uh, ARD, which is? Alcohol-related neurodevelopmental disorder. Okay, right. So it's under the umbrella. Okay. Um, and I'm not the typical drunk woman. I'm not the typical welfare woman. I've worked every day of my life. I've worked, you know, I've had a healthy family with my parents. You know, my mother drank wine once in a blue moon. You know, and, and it's, it's sometimes hard where we have non-native people 
judging us as First Nations people, saying, oh, well, you're just one of those drunks. Well, no, I was not like that. I worked all the time. I played soccer, not soccer, I played baseball. I played all these different sports. That's where my alcohol was about, right? The social drinking, when you have to go from the curling bond spill, well, what are you supposed to do? You're supposed to go upstairs and have a couple of drinks with the ladies. You know, you're supposed to do this, or, you know, baseball, where is it? It's, there's the alcohol. And so we're always forgetting about um, what society does, and we forget that that's their normal. Mm -hmm. You know, when you walk into a non-native home, and there's their liquor cabinet sitting right there, you know, to me that's like, oh, okay, that's abnormal for me. I am very proud of my children, you know, and the shame and the guilt that I felt when I actually started... I, I mean, I denied that I drank in my pregnancy at the beginning, and then when I started looking at my children, and then I finally had the strength to feel safe enough to say, I did drink in my pregnancy, and to acknowledge it. I've never had social services in my life. They've never, ever came to my door knocking on it about me and my children or my husband. My daughter is 22 years, turning 22. She is a youth worker at Kermode. She works in our organization. I work with women who struggle with addictions. I've put myself and changed my guilt and my shame into supporting other women who people don't understand, who they go, oh, she's just that drunk on the street. Well, you know, put yourself in her shoes and try and figure out what is it that happened to her. Why is she hurting? And I agree with you. As women, we don't drink to hurt our children. There's something going on inside us, and that's what people need to start looking at is what is going on inside us? Why do we choose to drink? You know, why, what, and, I, and I'm so thankful that you're saying this to, to, to the people, the audience out here, because they need to, to, to take a look. And if they can't work effectively with that woman, then is it really the woman, or is it how they are working with that woman? And maybe they need to change the way they are working with her. Maybe they need to help nurture that woman and empower her to make her feel that she is good enough and she deserves to have a good life. Well, you know, usually, um, that's right. And usually, when people are unable to look at the pain of another person, it's because they're not able to look at their own pain. Yeah, so thank you very much. Yeah. You just kind of enlightened me and made me feel good about what I do and why I do what I do. And I am very proud of my children. My daughter doesn't drink, she doesn't do drugs. Mm -hmm. My other children, one child, well, two children smoke dope, but they're not drinkers, right? <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know, I'm happy with that, you know? And, and people don't call my children problem children. They always say to me, Wow, you have such amazing children. So because my children might be affected, it doesn't mean that they have a death sentence and it does not mean that they're going to be right. a, a menace to society. So I am very proud of my children and what they've done and I just want people to realize that yes, these children can still succeed in life, but you have to believe in them. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Hi. thank you for coming. Um, I work with many community groups along this whole highway from Vanderhoof to Prince Rupert on uh, organizing against racism and hate. And a lot of what we do is very underfunded, very under you, under uh, what I'm hearing. We work well, you have to keep your priorities straight. I, I mean, the, yeah. The priorities, <laughs> I know. You know j jails are far more important. I know, I know. And yeah. we're, we work with a very small budget. But what I'm hearing from you tonight is what is that and a lot of what we do is we work in communities and we try to talk about segregation and oppression, but also about inclusion and what that really means yeah. and how it means, especially in small communities where we have resources that are so limited and groups that may work in isolation from one another. Yeah. I want to know, in hearing what you're saying, it sounds like it's almost prevention if we can create healthier, more united communities that recognize some of the very big different worlds we live in. It's not almost prevention. It is. That is prevention. Do you have examples of where you've seen organizations come together and look at it in that holistic model? You know, I don't accumulate such examples. Um, I've been to lots of communities where people do exactly what you're, or attempt to do exactly what you're just speaking of. Mm -hmm. um, do I know of a community? I, I, I certainly know that in there's some native communities where there's more of a sense of um, control mm -hmm. that's local rather than from the outside. People have managed somehow to maintain the reins of their government in their own hands. 
people tend to do better. So there's more sense of agency, uh, or more agency in the sense of being the agent, being the active person in your own life. I, I can't name for your organizations or groups. I'm sure there are such. Uh, I wouldn't but I want to tell you. Um, there is a book that came out a couple of years ago, and I wish I could tell you the title of it now. Um, but it's actually about the, the healing movement in Native communities. It was written by a journalist from, from Nova Scotia. Anybody know the title of that? It, it, she gives lots of examples of people that are working in positive ways. Yeah. Uh, I need to recall the title. I just can't think of it right now. Um, so no, I can't give you names of specific organizations, but I've met lots of people who are working in that direction mm -hmm. and who understand the importance of it. Mm -hmm. And I've seen lots of examples of success on small <coughs> micro levels. I've not seen a whole city or a whole community where this has actually been adopted. I, I haven't seen that, no. Yeah. Okay. Okay? Thank you. Sorry. All right. Uh, sure. Um, I have a question. I have a four-year-old son yeah. who just got diagnosed with the ARND plus okay. the severe ADHD. Okay. How would you give a parent like me to deal with him when I have, I don't have this, the ARND, but I have the ADD and ADHD. Yeah, well, uh, so do I. <laughs> and yeah. my daughter doesn't have any of it, and to deal with her and to deal with him and to try to get her to understand why he's so different and why she needs patience. Okay. You, 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 you mean the, your son's sister, is that right? Yes, my son's sister. How she, old, is, how old is, Your son is four years old? My son's four-year-old. And your sister? His sister will be seven in August. Don't even try. <laughs> First of all, it's not her responsibility. But, but because of the no, violence, don't, don't even she's seen don't, the don't, violence in the home? Don't explain anything to her because it's not fair to her. The situation is not fair to her. She didn't choose it. Okay. All this attention that the younger one gets and all the family energy that goes into just dealing with his issues and she's being ignored? No. No, no. well, she, no. she feels that way. Yeah, she feels that way. Yeah, I know, that's what I'm saying. Okay. Uh, don't try to argue her out of it because she's not a parent, she's not an adult. Just listen to her and, feel, and, 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 and validate her feelings. Yeah, this really feels lovely to you, doesn't it? He's getting all the attention. It's terrible. You must feel terrible. You know, no, just listen to her. Okay. Accept her feelings. They're totally valid. She'll come to understand it intellectually when she gets older. But to, to try and explain to her now is to try and make her into an adult before her time. Okay. And that's to put a burden on her that she just can't carry. And if she does, it'll make her sick. Because she'll take on responsibility that's not hers. Okay. Okay. However, so you need to be a parent to her, and that means listening to her and validating her and giving her as much only time as you possibly can find time for. Not that she asks for, but that you volunteer. Okay. Because if you give her attention that she asks for, she never knows why she's getting it. Am I getting it because I demand it, or am I getting it because mommy really wants to give it to me? So just stuff her full of attention until it's coming out of her ears. Okay. Okay? Whenever you got the energy and the time. Okay? Okay. That's the second point. Okay. I see you've got ADD. You're in a big hurry to get out of this. No. That's it. No. Okay. I, <laughs> just, 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 just. I can't stand still. That's okay. Well, neither can I. So, <laughs> <laughs> so we can just talk to each other. Okay? Uh, okay. So the, um, the third point is you've got to look after yourself. You've got to take responsibility for your own ADD. Okay, I highly recommend, if you haven't already, that you either listen, read my book, Scattered Minds, or you download the audio version and listen to it if you can't read, okay. uh, you know, if you can't focus that long to read, because it'll give you a totally different take on the condition than you've ever heard from anybody else. And it'll explain to you what it's actually about, which is goes back to your childhood stresses, and that there's things you can do for yourself in the present to, to deal with it. Okay. You know, so that, the short answer is, don't try and explain things to her. Let her be a kid, so listen to her and spend time with her. And thirdly, um, as best you can, 
take responsibility for your own stuff, and that'll create an atmosphere where your kids could be more at ease as well. Okay. Okay? Thank you. You're welcome. All right, going once. One more, One more question, yeah? I want to know your perspective on Ritalin. Ritalin? Ritalin My perspective on Ritalin? Well, here's the thing. So I've taken it myself. <coughs> now, Ritalin didn't affect me very well. It made me depressed. It made me focused, but depressed. But then I took, you know, but that's okay. That wasn't the right medication for me. It might be for somebody else. The stimulants in the short term certainly help people focus better and they can reduce the impulse problems. That's true, in the short term. In the long term, they don't do a whole lot. Because all they are is they're temporary agents that change the brain chemistry of the child as long as they're in the system. Now, if we understand ADD to be not a disease that the child inherits, which it isn't, contrary to all the opinion otherwise. The scientific proof for that is zero, if you look at it properly. If you understand that ADD, and I'll say much more about this tomorrow, is a problem of development, because the conditions weren't right, therefore, in, in children who are especially are predisposed, if the conditions aren't right, you're gonna get a certain, you know, failure of development, but that the long-term solution is development itself, then the question we'll be asking is not how do we control symptoms in the short term, but how do we promote development in the long term. So having said that, I'm not against medications, uh, but I'm certainly against what's happening with the medications. The number of prescriptions for stimulants in Canada in the last five years has gone up 43%. Uh, most of the time that a child is diagnosed, all that happens is that they get a prescription. Nobody talks to the parents about developmental issues, but you know, we don't look at it that way. A uh, few short rules, no kid should be forced to take any kind of medication, because not just because it's an invasion of their bodies, but also because no child should get the impression that the only way they're acceptable to adults is if they're medicated. That's not a message we should be conveying to any child. No child should be taking medications that give them bad side effects like stomach aches or anxiety or headaches or poor sleep or loss of appetite. And I've seen kids on medications for a long time with all those side effects. Because the, what we're looking at is not the child's experience but the child's behavior. Well, he's behaving better, it's good for him. Meanwhile, the child is suffering. Now, some children can take the medication beautifully with no side effects, with only positive effects. That's great. In the right dose, in the right hands, that's a good thing. But whether we give medication or not, we should not think it's the answer. It's not the answer. It's just temporary symptom control. The answer is still in development. That's my take on those medications. And the schools, by the way, should never make it a condition that the child takes medications for them to go to school. If, if we're in a, if we, and I speak to you as a former high school teacher, if, um, which I decided was way too stressful, so I went to medical school instead. <laughs> the, 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 uh, if, we're, if we're having a lot of kids in our society now that are being diagnosed with this or that disorder, then the schools should be places where that can be handled. And, and the teachers need training. And we need to have special ed teachers in there. We need to have lots of supports. And that's where the money should be going, not on computers. You know? and, and so that, so that um, the, the, the child should be able to go to school exactly the way he is. And the school should have provisions and programs and supports so that the child can be uh, well taken care of in that setting. Now, you know, again, if medications are appropriate, if the child accepts them, and if they help, I'm not against them. Yeah. Dr. Gamora Mete, thank you. Thank you for uh, your presentation. Um, uh, what I'm really grateful about is that you put it into context also about um, two societies of a larger society, uh, settler society, Canadian society, as well as indigenous society. And um, when we think about it, um, a lot of the language you're using speaks a lot to colonization 
and the impacts it has on peoples. And um, we, we've often addressed that not only were indigenous peoples colonized and assimilated, and, um, but also settler society is also colonized to become a Canadian, to, mm -hmm. you know, to no longer be from a distinct society uh, from other where, parts of the world, but to become um, part of this society. So it did produce a great deal of shame. And, and um, when, it, when I think about decolonization, um, it, it, it kind of gets muddled up because we're, we're working within the confines of colonial structure. We're working in organizations, we're working in townships, um, regions, we're working in that kind of a framework. And um, here in Wet'suwet'en in society, we had been shown the way for generations and that was disrupted with residential schools and foster care systems. At present, um, we see the, the numbers of children in care this year alone uh, supersedes the number of children that had attended residential school in all of residential school history across Canada. Really? And so what we're looking at is this other issue of um, what you're, you're, you also frame the context of our resources as peoples. And um, it's a very difficult concept because we abided by natural laws and that did not say that we had ownership of nature. It said that we had a relationship with it. And uh, what we're seeing too is, is that uh, settler society demands more and more and more of what they consider resources to help us pay for our pain and healing. And uh, we then jostle position and fill those positions and spend that money, meanwhile still being disenfranchised from the land and from where we truly belong, especially from our natural laws. So I guess my question is also about um, uh, trauma, um, trauma-related um, incidences in, in all of mainstream society, whether it's a settler society or indigenous society. And um, the question is more for the room, like um, how we can see ourselves, kind of remove ourselves from that colonial construct and include ourselves in nature and uh, include ourselves in, in um, natural law uh, because that's where all of our people have come from before. So what we have a major challenge in doing all of this is, is uh, finding that time. Uh, you, you've described um, uh, indigenous societies and how close they were to their children. And uh, what we see today is every generation in our families is separated throughout most of the week. And yep. uh, our social capital is diminished because society says, hey, configure yourselves differently so you can produce, so you can continue to take from nature and give to us and we'll give you money in return and you can spend it on your communities and, and keep working in that framework. And um, our question has to be about when do we let it all go and um, really, really do some real groundwork, some real grassroots work, and, um, and pressure settler governments to change and amend their laws so that they also reflect natural law. Because that's where our conflicts are arising, is, is um, we're in the way as indigenous societies. It's, it's, it's more profitable for a country to pay into maintaining poverty the way it is now rather than spending even half that amount to eradicate poverty. If so, so that's our conflict right now is, is where do we begin? When do we let this all go and, and stop trying to fit roles that don't belong to us? They're not of our design. If we're really going to combat racism, violence, and uh, addiction and uh, its effects on our peoples, um, we really need to have a really good look at our, our week-long activities, how much time we have with all of our generations present, and how they can decolonize, and what does that mean for a settler society to decolonize? Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um, so, I, no, I mean, I, you know, you didn't so much um, uh, ask a question as you threw out a challenge. 
and, 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 uh, and uh, not to me, but I mean to all of us. And, uh, and also, of course, you made a very powerful statement. I, so I won't reiterate what you said, because it doesn't need um, for me to add anything to it. I just, made a, I just made a couple of quick points. You talked about the trauma throughout society uh, in, 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 in the rest of society, as opposed to just the First Nation groups. Well, here's this American psychiatrist that I've uh, quoted earlier, and he said, people with childhood histories of trauma, abuse, and neglect make up almost the entire criminal justice population in the United States. Just about every single person in jail in this country or in the U.S. is there because of childhood trauma or neglect. So it's a general problem. It's not restricted. It's a problem of this society. And my next book, which I hope to write this fall, is tentatively entitled Toxic Culture, How Materialistic Society Makes Us Sick. Okay? Encompassing some of the ideas that you expressed. The second point is that what you said about the, how we spend our time and away from our kids and then, you know, well, that, th this book, I don't know if you're familiar with, I co-wrote it, it's not my work, it's the work of a friend of mine, a wonderful psychologist, Gordon Neufeld, who, he's probably been up here, has he not? Yeah, he's been here, yeah. So Gordon and I wrote this book together, and he talks about how, in, how we've lost the connection with our kids because of all the factors that you talked about. And the consequence of that is that kids whose brains have to connect to somebody, if the adults are not around, they'll connect to other kids. And so now for the first time in history, you've got kids being the major influence on each other's development. I'll say much more about that tomorrow, but that's a direct consequence of the factors you described. And that book is called Hold On To Your Kids, and it's a major problem throughout society. So, so kids are meant to be initiated uh, into the adult world by elders and adults, and now they're being initiated into the world by peers. And of course, when it comes to drug use specifically, the commonest context for beginning drug use is in the peer group. And all that's because kids have lost their adult attachments, and they lost their adult attachments because economically, we've broken up those family and village and neighborhood structures that held kids safe in a context of adult relationships. Hi. May I just make one last comment on that part of it, is that I hope that we don't get the impression that this is a First Nations problem. This is a societal, worldwide problem. I've worked in the Soviet <laughs> Union, all over the place. This Absolutely. is a world problem. Not only, it's, it's, it's indigenous to our Earth. Absolutely, and uh, of course, if you look at um, countries like Greece right now, because of the economic crisis, that the uh, kind uh, bankers of Europe have thrust upon Greece, now there's more suicides in Greece in the last half year and more alcoholism. And that means there'll be more kids born with uh, fetal alcohol problem. And in, uh, in the Soviet Union, of course, the, uh, there's been a tremendous rise in alcoholism uh, for economic, social reasons, and for reasons of dislocation and disruption of communities that we've talked about, of course you're gonna see, see the same thing over there. The reason I keep uh, or I emphasize the First Nations connection is for obviously because of this area and this country. And, um, but that doesn't make it a uniquely First Nation problem, you're quite right, and uh, they just happen to be uh, manifesting it more tragically, perhaps, statistically, than other segments of the population, but it's a, it's a human problem. It's a human problem, which might be a good uh, note to end this conversation on, that we're dealing with a human problem here, and it's something that can't be um, uh, differentiated into, uh, as, as Natalie said in the beginning, into race or class or, or so on. It's a human problem, it's a problem of human pain and human suffering, and therefore the solution has to be humanity. Thank you. Thank you.